This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 11. This week, U.S. Navy Captain Eric Anduzzi joins us to discuss the biggest, baddest warship to ever sail the high seas, the nuclear-powered American aircraft carrier. Push it. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat. I am your host, Vincent Aiello. And the communications you just heard during that intro bumper are from some carrier qualifications on the USS Ronald Reagan off the coast of Southern California some time ago. If you jump on YouTube and search for carrier communications, it's the first one to come up. At least it did for me. Anyway, hope everyone is doing well. We are back to our normal scheduling. And we've had a little excitement here in the Aiello house. I have two out of three boys that have broken arms, one from a skateboard and one from a snowboard. So we wrapped the third one in bubble wrap, and we're trying to make it through that. But I'll tell you, of course, as parents, it's nothing compared to those who are grieving over the losses we've had in military aviation this past week. I'm recording this on April 8th, 2018, and I think we had a spate of three or four mishaps within the course of a couple of days, including a CH-53 super stallion that went down from the Marine Corps and killed four people. And then, of course, we lost... Thunderbird 4, and that hit close to home because he was a cousin to one of the police officers in the small community here where I live in San Diego. So definitely a tragic situation. And, you know, there are some in the news that are ready to blame this on some sort of readiness issue or funding or something else. And certainly that could be the case. But, you know, just a quick side note. Again, it is very tragic for the families. But when two or three mishaps happen at a time, statistically speaking, it's not uncommon. Humans are prone to look at patterns and say, oh, that's got to be caused by something. And in fact, if you ever go to a casino like Las Vegas and you walk up to the roulette table, that is exactly why they have the little history tracker there because when it shows four or five reds in a row, they're banking on the fact that you think it's going to be black, so you plop down some money on black. But the fact is, it's still roughly 50-50. Of course, it depends on how many of those little green ones they've got. Uh, It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. And again, there could be some possible reason why mishaps are occurring, but when there is as much flying as happens between the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps day in and day out, and it's a hazardous activity, there will just be sometimes a spate of a couple mishaps at a time. And again, if I didn't already say so, it certainly does not detract from the tragedy of the situation for sure for those who lost their lives. All right, and happier news announcement-wise, we've sent our first Fighter Pilot Podcast newsletter recently. If you're not signed up for that, I encourage you to do so on our website, or you can just send us an email and I'll sign you up. Also, by popular demand, we started a Patreon page. People wanted to help support this show and offset some of the costs that I incur for running the show, and I do appreciate that. So we did start a Patreon page, and if you go to patreon.com and search for Fighter Pilot Podcast, You can check it out, support us if you want, but there's free stuff on there as well. But if you do sign up to be one of our supporters, you gain access to exclusive material and behind-the-scenes stuff. So you might check that out and see if you like it. All right, on to the question and answer segment for this episode. And first up is an email question from Amir in Mission Viejo, California. This is in multiple parts, so I'll address them as such. He asks, firstly, what do fighter pilots generally think of the movie Top Gun? Aren't you upset that they tried to force a romance into the film instead of focusing on the true love between a pilot and his plane? Uh, Amir, I believe most people like the movie. I certainly do. Most of my friends do. I mean, it's, you know, we have to get through some of the hokey parts of it. And so for that, we're a little embarrassed to say we like it, but we do. And of course, we get ribbed for the volleyball scene and whatever else. But Actually, I think putting a romantic part of it was brilliant because when I was 16, when this movie came out, I don't know if I had a girlfriend at the time, but I assume if I did, I could have taken her and I could have enjoyed the flying scenes and she could have enjoyed the romance part of it, if I can generalize there. So yeah, you know, whatever. It's a good movie. It's compelling. We enjoy it. We hope they don't screw up the second one. All right. Second question Amir asks is, how important do you think a passion for aviation is in being a fighter pilot? 
Are there those who developed a passion after learning to fly, or is it absolutely necessary to love aviation prior to serving as a military pilot? That is, if you want any chance of making it through your career without burning out. Well, Amir, I don't know anyone who is a fighter pilot just because it's a job. I mean, there's way too much work and effort and separation from family that goes into doing this to just do it because it's something you do to get paid for. Most fighter pilots love what they do. They love the people. They love the challenge. They do have a passion for it. So I don't know how to really answer that. I suppose it's like asking how important is it for a frog to enjoy swimming. I mean, it's just what it does. And of course, a frog doesn't have a choice if it's a frog or not. So it's probably a dumb analogy. And if I haven't said so before, I'm full of all kinds of crazy analogies. But You know, I I don't think people go through the effort it takes to become a fighter pilot if they don't have a passion for doing it. So, I don't know. It was certainly a passion for me, and it is for most of my friends that do it also. And lastly, Amir asks, are there any differences between the skills and good fighter pilots are required to have today and the skills of successful fighter pilots of previous generations? Well, that is a good question. I probably should have posed that to Bill Driscoll when we had our interview with him, the Vietnam ace. I would say that I think you still have to have control of yourself and the ability to handle your fear and the possibility of your own mortality. But also today, there's so much more automation that I think you have to be good with understanding all that and being able to be a master of your aircraft. And I almost said your program. And I guess there's probably some truth to that because, you know, the computers these days involved you're as much a fighter pilot as you are a computer programmer. So you, you've definitely got to be good at the technological side of it today. But at any rate, I think it's always attracted the same type of type A personality. They're proactive. They're self-learners. They're not risk averse. And so I think we're just different because the world is different today. But I think we're all cut from the same cloth. All right, next, let's go to a phone call. Hey, Jello, this is Vince Bell, a helicopter pilot from San Diego, giving you a call. Just got a couple questions about helmet visors sparked by your own yellow tint example, as well as the gold visors of the Blue Angels and the blue mirrors that the Tomcat demo guys used to wear, too. I've heard those were made by Oakley. Maybe you could clarify on that if you know. Uh, Anyway, to the question, first, what options exist within the gear that you guys are issued? I know maybe you get a tinted one and a clear one or something like that. Is there anything else? And also, what would be available for you to buy if that's the case? I mean, I could imagine maybe a couple specialty companies would make stuff for you. Second, there are a lot of pictures of guys wearing sunglasses instead of visors. So I was wondering, are there any rules that apply to you guys when you have to have a visor on or when sunglasses would be appropriate, maybe in reference to eye protection or how much eye protection does a visor actually give you? for something that may happen, maybe a rapid decompression in the cockpit and the uh, glass blows out or something like that. Uh, And then third, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about why you selected a yellow visor. Um, I know uh, personally I fly with sunglasses on, but I fly with a a different tint, not just dark sunglasses, something that gives a little bit better visual acuity. So, yeah, those are my questions. Love your show and uh, love what you're doing. Keep up the amazing work. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your question, Vince. Now, I was never a Blue Angel or a Tomcat pilot, so I don't know. I have asked a fighter pilot Facebook group I'm a part of to see if anyone else has any situational awareness on that. But my guess is simply that the Blue Angels have a supply system for their particular visor, and the Tomcat guys all went out and found something they could purchase out in the market for them. So whether it was made by Oakley or not, I don't know. As you correctly identify, though, the options for our visors are the tinted, the clear, and the yellow. And I don't know of anyone who ever bought their own. I don't know if that's authorized or not because they have to meet certain specifications. So we always just wore whatever was available to us. And I think there might have even been some laser protection visors available as well, although I never wore them as a visor. I just wore the laser protection glasses. Now, your question regarding sunglasses, I guess it's for the same reason why people wear sunglasses at all. If you're up there and your tinted visor is not working to your satisfaction for whatever reason, or in my case with the yellow visor, if you just decided you want to raise it and put on your sunglasses, then people did. And there wasn't really any direction one way or the other on that. The only times we really had to wear our visor was when we were walking around the flight deck of the aircraft carrier, as we'll talk about here in a little bit. 
when flight operations were happening to protect your eyes, and also in low altitude environments because you're more likely to hit a bird or something else. As far as the protection goes, I, I mean, I can't sit here and tell you it can stop a certain bullet, but not another. Probably can't stop any bullet, but you know, it is enough to in an ejection, if it stays on your head, uh, you know, it's going to protect your eyes better than nothing. Now for me, why yellow? Well, when I got to my first squadron in Jacksonville, Florida, we had a gentleman there. His name was Speedy Miller, and he used to fly, I believe it was US 3s, and he liked a yellow visor, and we were young and impressionable, and he was a little bit more salty, so he encouraged us to try it, and I did find that it worked better, especially on overcast days, but I just became accustomed to it, and I've used it ever since. People who try it later on don't like it because if you are above an overcast or in a bright sunny day, then it's a little harder, but my eyes just became adjusted to it. And I would always carry sunglasses for the reasons I talked about a moment ago, but I rarely put them on. Good questions, Vince, thanks. All right, next question from Bob. I'm not sure where Bob is from. His is also in multiple parts. He says, in the call signs episode, Ferg made a comment that I interpreted as there may be multiple people with the same call sign. Is that possible or is there some master list that your call sign is added to and therefore not usable by anyone else? And do they get retired with the pilot? Uh, well, Bob, many people can have the same call sign. It would be far too arduous to have a list that someone kept up with everyone's call signs. So... No, it's not uncommon for people to have the same call sign, especially not so. Anyone, like I said in episode two, whose last name is wise, smart, strong, or whatever, those guys are generally not so, and there was plenty of them. I don't know of any call sign, like a jersey, you know, of a baseball player or something that gets retired. I, I don't know of any call signs that have been, quote unquote, retired. Next, Bob asks, who pays for the flight schooling? Who pays for you to get sent to Top Gun? You do, Bob. Thank you very much. The taxpayer. We do not pay for our own schooling unless we want to do something on the side. Not only do we not pay, but we also get paid. So the military, as you probably know, runs on congressional funding, and that is provided by taxpayers. And finally, says Bob, have you ever seen any UFOs while in the air? Can you even talk about it? Ha ha. <laughs> uh, Bob, no, I have never seen anything that I was not able to identify. And as Commander Fravor has recently demonstrated, if you do think you've seen something, yes, you absolutely can talk about it. And I'm not prepared to levy a judgment on what he saw. He believes in what he saw in his story. But no, I never saw anything that I would classify as a UFO. All right, last question then for today is from John Mark from Birmingham, Alabama, again in multiple parts. Hello, says John Mark. I'm applying for OCS, if you recall, that means Officer Candidate School, and a Naval Aviator slot this spring. I have a few questions I've always wondered. One, do fighter pilots always carry a sidearm when flying on deployments? No, John Mark, you don't have to. Most people do because it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. But I will confess that as I got more senior and the flights became more benign, that I dispensed with carrying it because it was just a pain in the butt to check it out from the duty officer and count each individual bullet. And then when you wear it, it's uncomfortable on those longer missions. Certainly, if had I gone down, I probably would have wished I had it available. But even then, your chance of using it effectively are probably pretty small. So I got lazy and quit carrying one, frankly. Two, ask John Mark, how do fighter pilots manage urinating while flying long missions? Well, John Mark, I cannot speak for females, but for males, we can carry what's called a piddle pack. And it's a small plastic bag that has, some of the older ones had sponges in them, but nowadays they've got some sort of material that looks like sand. And you open it, of course you put your aircraft on autopilot and you tell your wingman what you're doing uh, without too much detail so that you know you don't bump into each other. And of course it has to be during a benign portion of flight, you're not gonna do it while aerial refueling, for example. But you unroll it, you make the arrangements to make the fluid go where it needs to go. And then this little sand or whatever is in there, it gels up so that if you don't wrap it properly and it were to tip over, it doesn't spill out as a fluid. It turns into kind of a semi-solid like jello, I suppose. Wait a minute. I wonder if I should be worried about that. Anyway, so I think the most I ever used was two or three bags at once. And then when you, when you get back, uh, environmentalists, cover your ears, please, real quick. Then when you get back on the flight deck and you land and you're walking down, you just toss them overboard and off they go into the great abyss. So, yeah, that's how we do it. Um, if you have to go number two, thankfully I never had to deal with that. Not sure what I would do. 
Next question from John Mark. Are fighter pilots allowed to personalize their aircraft beyond squadron markings, i.e. nose art of World War II planes? No. Question four. Do, okay, real quick, John Mark. My wife, I don't know if she was still my fiance at the time, when I deployed one time, she was a kindergarten teacher then, and she had this little sticker of a bear. I don't know why, but she stuck it on my name tag on my flight suit. And when I got in the airplane to fly off to the ship for my deployment, I pulled it off my name tag and stuck it on the next to one of the switches. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I left it there. And sure enough, uh, we get on the ship and a day or two later, we're having an all pilot meeting and the maintenance officer stands up and says, all right, whoever's putting stickers on the airplane, knock it off. And he knew it was me because he'd already checked who was flying it, but he just reminded everyone not to personalize the airplane. So no, generally we do not do that. Next, John Mark asks, do Navy flyers ever practice dogfighting Air Force fighters? How do Navy fighters compare to Air Force fighters head-to-head? Are there differences in fighting mentalities between the branches? Uh, Yes, I did have a chance to swirl it up with the Air Force quite a bit. And I would say, for the most part, we are pretty equally capable. And if it's all right with you, John Mark, I'm going to save this question for a future episode because I'm hoping to either bring on a Navy guy who's done an Air Force tour or vice versa, and we can talk more in depth about some of the differences in mentalities and the way we we fight. And lastly, what does a typical day week look for a Navy fighter pilot on and off deployment? I hear naval aviators are officers first and pilots second regarding their duties. Well, John Mark, I won't speak for everyone, but I certainly tried to be. It's just a matter of professionalism that you take care of equipment and other people and your peers. And then, of course, you want to be good at what you do, which is a pilot. So I certainly tried to be a good naval officer first, but I also tried to be a good naval pilot. And I hope I was able to do so. Ashore, it's very difficult to say what a typical day looks like, but, you know, generally, you will come into work depending on what you're doing. If you're flying early, then of course you show up early to take care of that. If you're flying at night, then you don't show up too early because you have a crew day, which is just the length of your day that can only be generally about 12 hours. And you don't want to go any longer than that because then fatigue is a problem. If you're flying at night, you want to be well rested. So typically you'd come in later. But if you were flying, then you would generally prepare for that flight at some point. If you had other collateral duties, then you would take care of those. There would always be meetings and training, and you'd have to go to the base administration to take care of paperwork or something else. So it's really hard to say what a typical day looked like. A float, not much different, except that everything is confined within about 1,100 feet and 250 feet and several stories, as you'll learn here in a moment. But same thing, you would have meetings and you'd have to take care of other people and other things and take care of yourself, you know, go exercise, eat, uh, go to chapel if you wanted or whatever. And it just depended on where you were and what you were doing. Sometimes you were flying so much you couldn't do the other things. Other times you were transiting and you didn't fly at all. And so all you did were the other things. So thanks for your question, John Mark, and good luck with your OCS and Naval Aviator slot. Please let us know what happens. We'd like to follow back with you. All right. Well, we are going to get into the interview with Pappy and Doozy here. And I will tell you, this is a longer interview. I tried to cut as much as I could, but it's just fascinating stuff. So I think you might find me interrupting it at some point, And we might split this up into a second part that I will release later. So let's go ahead and roll tape here and we'll see how it goes. And we'll here we go. Okay, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are talking aircraft carriers, part one, the ship itself. Here to help me do that is U.S. Navy Captain Eric Anduzzi, call sign Pappy. Pappy, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, whatever it is. Wherever the listener is, right? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Well, welcome to the show. We're going to go through what an aircraft carrier is and some facts about it. And then on parts two and three, we'll talk about landings day and night. But before we get to that, could you give the listener a quick background, where you're from, what you've done so far, so they can get to know you? So originally, I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico, born and raised down there. Went to uh, the U.S. Naval Academy through the Naval Academy Prep School up in Newport, Rhode Island. Selected aviation, selected F-14 Tomcats, and went to VF-101 at Oceana, Virginia, uh, and became a F-14A pilot. Did several tours in Virginia Beach. Eventually ended up being an instructor, going to Top Gun, and uh, commanding an F-18 squadron out of Oceana, Virginia, the uh, world-famous Puking Dogs. Out of there, I selected nuclear power as my major command 
and uh, became the XO of USS Carl Vinson after completing nuclear power school and prototype in Charleston in New York, uh, upstate New York. Okay, and so that was your most recent tour. My most recent tour was uh, USS Carl Vinson being the, what we call the big XO. That's right. And you were instrumental in allowing me to hold my retirement ceremony on that ship. That's right. A little over a year ago. Thank you very much. And did we decide earlier, did you come through Top Gun when I was there? I think I just... So you were just starting your Blue IP course okay. while I was uh, a student. All right. So I was probably still knee deep in it all because I'm sorry I don't have to say I don't remember. <laughs> Absolutely. No, okay. you, you were not a, a Blue IP yet. You okay. were going through your syllabus at that point. All right. Outstanding. Excellent. All right. Well, so just coming from the Carl Vinson as the XO, uh, let's jump into this discussion and start off with, I mean, I think everyone listening probably knows what an aircraft carrier is, but just give us a big picture overview of this gigantic ship, would you? The aircraft carrier is an instrument for our uh, policymakers to influence the world. It is four and a half acres of U.S. sovereign land. It is Roughly 1,100 feet long, about 250 feet wide, uh, displaces roughly 100,000 tons uh, and can uh, deploy anywhere on the world uh, on a moment's notice and provide the facilities for airplanes, helicopters to do their business. Carries a complement of about 5,000 people. 3,200 of those belong to the ship itself, what we call ship's company, and 1,800 are part of the air wing and the embark staff. We have a uh, Desron staff embarked, and we have the strike group staff embarked. It is a floating city. It's got welders. It's got plumbers. It's got a medical center, a chapel. Dentists, right? And post office. and Absolutely. Dentists, post office, five dining facilities. It is in a self-sustaining city out on the sea. And as you said, a little bit of American territory everywhere it goes. So a gigantic ship, uh, really, to, to summarize. Uh, too big, I believe, still to go through the Panama Canal. Is that correct? I think that it will be now that uh, the Panama Canal has had its uh, upgrade. Okay. Yes, but uh, in the past, it was not able to go through the Panama Canal. Okay. So an 1,100 feet long, I mean, among the longest ships there are, and in fact, I think the Empire State Building is about 1,250 feet tall. So if you could, you know, take an aircraft carrier and sit it on its tail next to the Empire State Building, it's almost as tall. So just a gigantic ship, I think, for anyone who's never seen one, it's hard to imagine because you see a picture and there's no sense of scale. But I don't know about you, Pappy, every time... I'd get on or off the ship. I couldn't help it. Even if it was a six-month deployment and we pulled into port, you'd see everybody on the little Liberty boat turn around and just look at the thing because it's just massive. It is It is pretty <laughs> impressive to watch it while you're standing on the pier mm. and, and the sheer size of it. And you, you don't get it when you get on board because you're just walking around, walking around. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if anybody ever has a chance to do an embark, it is a completely different feeling to watch it from the pier to, that to be aboard. When you're aboard, you, you miss out on the sheer volume right. of the ship. And conversely, when you, as you well know, are at 25,000 feet and the sun's getting ready to set and it's a wide open ocean with some nice clouds and you're just sitting there, you know, enjoying the moment and you look down on this vast ocean, you see this postage stamp, as the expression goes, and you think to yourself, holy cow, I have to land on that. <laughs> and it looks tiny. So talk about a lesson in perspective. Absolutely. It looks tiny, and then you get closer, and you're like, oh, my goodness, this thing is, is gigantic. For sure. <laughs> now, how much does it draft? How deep is it from the water line down to the keel? So it's about 40-foot draft, wow. depending on the amount of fuel we carry, the amount of airplanes we have on board. Mm -hmm. um, the air wing complement, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but it's about currently 75 to 80 airplanes on board of several different types that we carry, and uh, it's it's significant. Sure. So 5,000 people, you said not all of them are always there. So the ship itself is its own command. And Correct. in your case, on the Carl Vinson, was based here in San Diego. It was. We have some based in Norfolk and then some in Japan. Or one. And some in Pacific Northwest as well. Oh, that's right. Uh, that's right. Up in uh, Bremerton. Okay. Um, so some folks are assigned to the ship, but some just... Come and visit. Okay. And customers, as we call them, customers. right? There are customers. Okay. So uh, the carrier and air wing team will join for deployments and workups. and Exactly. And, and we'll go through a training cycle, and uh, it's what we call workups in our, in mm -hmm. our business, right? The, uh, the air wing does training on their own. The ship does training on our own, getting qualifications, whether it's on navigation, on damage control, on repairs. And as these exercises 
get completed, the team merges together and becomes a, a cohesive fighting unit that then go, goes ahead and deploys for whether it's five, six, seven, ten months uh, as a team. So I like to use football analogies on the show for some reason. I never mm. realized I was a very big football fan, but it'd be maybe like summer camp. You got your offense on one field, your defense on the other, and then maybe on scrimmage day they come together as a team, although that's a bad example, I suppose, because they don't play on the field at the same time. But in this case, we're doing our separate preparation in some cases, getting together, and then we deploy as a team. For well, you, you could look at it and you have wide receiver drills and you have running right. back drills and you have offensive line drills, and then you put them all together to become an go. offense. Sure. Yeah, there you go. That's, Absolutely. That's a good one. Okay. Now, how fast can something this big go? So uh, the unclassified uh, number is uh, 30 plus knots. 30 knots. So that's roughly 35 miles per hour, 1.2 knots per nautical right. mile. So We've actually talked about that before on the show, and we got a little mm. glossary where people can get definitions. And we achieve that with four shafts, two nuclear reactors that provide the power for the aircraft carrier to you know, propel itself through the water. So four shafts, meaning these are the drive trains, if you will, connected to the propellers. And the propellers are what, like 20 feet across or something? About 17 feet. Whew. Dang. Probably weigh several tons themselves. Uh, I would imagine. And then the anchors weigh, golly, one link weighs like 500 pounds, doesn't it? Absolutely. Of the anchor chain. Goodness. So it really is big. For folks out there who've had never had a chance, there's a lot of museums on both coasts. There's mm -hmm. the USS Midway here in San Diego. There's the USS Intrepid, I believe, in New York City. Yes, and there's the a few Lexington others. is in Charleston. Right. Okay. So there's a couple. You yeah, need there, to go there do are yourself a couple. A favor mm -hmm. and check one out. Now you said nuclear reactors. So theoretically, these things don't need to refuel, correct? So they do. Uh, after what, a long time. After a long time, it takes roughly about 25 years. A ship is built for a 50 year lifespan with a one time refueling, roughly about midlife. But we can't operate all the time. Just on nuclear power. We need provisions, we need jet fuel, and we roughly refuel on those aspects about once a week. So if we're busy doing flight operations, we need to have another ship come alongside, and they can cast lines back and forth and transfer fuel and stores, and then usually helicopters are going back and forth, right, bringing more ammunition, food. I mean, we can replenish right there at, what, 15, 20 miles an hour. Correct. We, we usually do it at 12 knots. We will go ahead and pull alongside the other ship. The other ship does, usually does the base course, and they'll be the, the steady platform, if you will. And then okay, the so carrier, they're going to head due east, let's say. So they will pick a heading, 090 at, at 12 knots. Right. And then the carrier will sit up behind it and will slowly approach, offset to usually the port side, and then uh, end up a beam of the ship roughly about 200 feet away, and at which point we will throw some lines over, throw some cables over, fuel hoses come across, right. and we start doing the what's called UNREP. Underway replenishment. Underway replenishment, And then meanwhile, correct. the supply ship can have another ship on the other side of it, on the starboard side, so that's the right side. Absolutely. And someone else can refuel, so. Yes, right. and, and then so then the helicopter part becomes the vert rep, vertical replenishment. Vertical replenishment. So Excellent. we can just do UNREP. We can do unrep and vert rep, or we can just do vert rep. And in which case, the ships don't have to be so close to each other. If the if vert rep is the only thing we're doing, absolutely. We can be 500 feet far. We can be half a mile apart. We usually still like to be pretty close so that the helos have to travel a shorter distance. Right. But there's no need for the 200 feet, which, right. which gets pretty... Intense. That's you're like a blue angel flying in formation at that point. Your whole attention of the bridge team is committed to making sure we don't absolutely we swap we, great pain. Uh, we do a lot of height, heightening of watches, and instead of helmsmen, we have master helmsmen now. It is a big deal for the ships to be that close. Excellent. Okay. Now, how many aircraft carriers does the Navy have right now? The Navy has eleven aircraft carriers right okay. now. And what is the significance of an aircraft carrier? I mean, you mentioned it at the very top of the discussion here, but I mean, this isn't just some frigate, and I don't mean to denigrate our brothers in the surface warfare community, but, you know, frigates and destroyers, they're all over the place. You don't hear too much about them, but carriers carry a little more significance, don't they? Co correct. So like I said at the beginning of the show, it's, it's an instrument for our policymakers to influence, whether it's friends or adversaries, right? Right. Uh, and it can be with power projection, which is the air wing, or it can be with presence, uh, which drives hopefully a little bit of deterrence, whatever the policymakers wants to do. It gives us the flexibility to operate wherever we want, whenever we want, without having to ask for somebody else's permission to land at their land or overfly their land. So uh, a big 
tool in the toolkit for those uh, individuals to establish policy. So leaders have various methods at their disposal to drive behavior, might be one way to put it, of other countries. One of those is diplomatic, one is economic, and one is militarily. Mm -hmm. And essentially what you're saying is we can park an airbase right off their shore with strike aircraft. And it's significant because we have firepower to back up what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And, and right. with an air force that is superior to, well, I think it's like 85% of the world's air forces. Just right there on a carrier. It is a significant power projection tool. There's some saying supposedly that anytime there's a crisis around the world, the president's first question is, where's the nearest carrier? So don't know if that's true or not, but... I haven't been in that room myself, but (laughs) but I hear the same thing. And I won't be ever, most likely. But yeah, so uh, evidently, because the president knows, as does the leadership, that this is an instrument that has significant influence, and we can move it and make a lot of statements and messages. Outstanding. Okay. Well, let's dive into some of the actual operations. I mean, we already talked about replenishment a little bit, which was cool. Uh, but let's talk about the ship and we'll kind of start. I, don't, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about the insides. I mean, the, the insides are what you would expect of a no frills military ship. I mean, you've got the passageways and it's not like a cruise ship where it looks real nice. I mean, the cables and wires and plumbing and pipes are all hanging out. It's just, it's functional. It's functional whether, you know, bulkheads have knee knockers because of structural integrity, because right. uh, because because of uh, um, damage control, right. firefighting, Contain flooding it, it, it is absolutely the business end right. of a ship. But let's talk about the hangar bay. So right away, if you ever come up to one of these on the brow, you'll probably land on the hangar bay. And so that's this big cavernous inside, the stomach, if you will, of the aircraft carrier. What's the purpose of that particular space? So the hangar bay, like you said, it is the, the belly of the ship, right? It, it holds um, a space in which... The air wing can conduct maintenance. They can uh, have the ready airplanes stored. We can move a lot of airplanes down there in order to protect them from the elements if we were going to have a storm or something like that. But it's basically the the maintenance hangar for the aircraft carrier. It's divided up into three bays. Some of it is used for storage. We conduct a lot of physical fitness classes down there. But when it's time for business, it's mostly maintenance. It's mostly firefighting, it's mostly keeping the airplanes ready to go in the hangar bay. It's about 700 feet long and about 150 feet wide, so it is a giant space that occupies about four stories. Wow. And so, as you said, you've got drop tanks hanging from the ceiling, you have extra components, large components that you might need for the aircraft or the ship itself on the walls. And it's just kind of the big central system of the carrier and and it's protected, right? So it's not open to the elements. I mean, a lot of times it is if it's good weather, but we can secure doors and whatnot. So like I said, there are three bays, right? Uh, The first bay, which is on the forward end of the ship, has its own elevator and its own hangar bay doors. These doors are blast resistant They protect from elements. They protect from uh, incoming weapons, from blast. They are big, solid doors. Between Hangar Bay 1 and Hangar Bay 2, there are another set of doors that separate the Hangar Bays in case of fire, in case of flooding. Whatever the case may be, those doors go ahead and separate uh, Hangar Bay 1 and Hangar Bay 2. Hangar Bay 2 has its own elevator with its own set of Hangar Bay doors. And then the last one back aft is Hangar Bay 3, and it has two elevators and two uh, Hangar Bay doors, one on the port side, one on the starboard side, to move airplanes in and out. And most of the time, we uh, keep ready airplanes close to those doors in case that something needs to be moved up to the flight deck quickly. And the elevators do that. So how much capacity can these elevators hold because aircraft are not light? So aircraft uh, are are pretty heavy. Uh, You know, a Super Hornet weighs roughly 50,000 pounds, and we can put two Super Hornets on an elevator and move them both up to the flight deck. And in in fast speed, we can make that happen in under 20 seconds. Moving the airplanes on and off the elevator takes a little bit longer, but the actual ride up stairs or downstairs just takes about 20 seconds or so. So these are no Otis elevators at your local Howard Johnson. I mean, these things are pretty stout, and you're moving 100,000 pounds, a few stories, in a 20 seconds. That's yeah, they impressive. are a beefy piece of machinery <laughs> with cables, hydraulic rams. Uh, it is a well-built elevator. Excellent. 
I'll tell you a quick story. I got married, actually, on the flight deck of the John F. Kennedy in Mayport, Florida. It was my wife's idea, actually. And we walked off at the end, you know, to the music or whatever, and, and they allowed everyone to go over to Elevator 4 on the port side because the wedding was set up um, on the fantail where the wires would normally be, and they lowered them all at once. And people told me later they enjoyed that more than the ceremony. <laughs> that is one of the highlights. Whenever there's an event on the on an aircraft carrier is, hey, are we going to get elevator rides? Yeah. And you can move a lot of people oh, at yeah. once if you use an elevator. And it doesn't matter. Even if you tell them it's about to start, they always let out a gasp the moment it does because it's like that Tower of Terror at Disneyland. You know, all of a sudden it just drops out a little from you. It does. And then <laughs> when it hits the bottom and it clangs against the big metal, everybody gets That's a little right. bit of shock as well. All right. All right, so hangar bay, big area that can be closed, but a lot of times it's open in good weather. We can do our maintenance. They also will have all hands calls in there, which is simply get as many people as you can who aren't on duty to come in and listen to the admiral or some dignitary or even concerts. I, I've sat through a few concerts in Absolutely. There. It is a, a big space, and mm-hmm. like you said, the uses are multiple where right. it's area. auditorium, conference bay, gym, uh, when we have... Uh, Hangar bay cookouts, we put grills in the elevators, and then we we all conglomerate. There's bouncy houses, there's, you know, sumo wrestling, there, <laughs> there's movies going on. We It's a multi-use right. space, and like I said, it's, it's 700 feet long and three, 150 feet wide, so it is a pretty big space. And, and just to be clear to the listener, uh, you and I know this, obviously, Pappy, it's not every Friday night that we have bouncy houses mm-hmm. and cookouts. It's maybe once or twice an eight-month deployment, if we're lucky. Correct. Yeah, we, we actually had one Steel Beach picnic, is what we call it, right, uh, last deployment, and last deployment was five months, so we wow. did it once during okay. a five-month deployment. And I've only, in my five deployments on carriers, I only ever did one swim call where they stopped and put a little small boat in the water and some rescue mm-hmm. guys and co- coordinated it off where we could swim. And I want to say I jumped off a lowered elevator, but maybe I didn't. Did you, did so, you get, so I don't remember. I I, we just did it in, uh, on Vincent. Okay. We did a swim call on our way back home. Uh, we anchored off of Hawaii. And we lowered elevator four, and everybody you know, jumped, jump off jumped and off the elevator floor. And, and it, I tell you what, it's pretty uh, entertaining to watch people come up to the elevator edge and realize <laughs> what 33 feet up looks like. Yeah, A lot of hesitant looks. And we had some folks that didn't make it, didn't jump. And if you're not following the instructions, crossing your feet and... Tucking your arms, it, it smacks. <laughs> if you do jump, it's going to hurt. So, yeah. Now, it's 33 feet to a lowered elevator. How high is it to the flight deck? So, the flight deck is roughly about 60 feet wow. up from the waterline. And then how high to the very top, whatever the most highest antenna is? About 110 feet or so okay. is uh, the highest point on the carrier. So, I believe it can go under the Golden Gate Bridge, but I don't think we can go under, like, the Coronado Bridge here in San Diego. Is that sound so, right? So, I think that we can go under both. It's just that we... There's nothing for us to do on the other side of Coronado. It's it too shallow down but, uh, there. It, but it can go underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And, of course, you can work and, on tides mm-hmm. and all that other stuff oh, yeah. and get another 5, 10 feet of tide. But, uh, okay. but, yeah, about 110 feet or so. Excellent. All right. So let's make our way up to the flight deck then. Now, the first thing is, as you said, it's about four and a half acres. It does have an angle. We learned that the hard way a long time ago that aircraft are landing. You want them to have a little bit of an angle so that if they miss all the wires, they go off to the side instead of up the rest of the flight deck. Instead of going into a crash barrier, which is what they did on the old days, That's right? That's true. Of course, Remember, their it, speeds were a lot lower. It, but they yeah. were a lot lower, but you would land the first airplane, and it would go all the way to the front, and then they would raise a crash barrier right behind it. Goodness. And, and you know, we keep going all the way back. So, yeah, in the in the 50s, mm-hmm. they realized, hey, angle decks uh, offer a lot of advantages. And we now build them with angle decks. Sure. And not all countries build them with right. angle decks, as a matter of fact. And so, some build them with ski jumps, and we don't. Exactly. Um, but also, back then, I guess, I don't know when the last wooden deck carrier was, but they, we used to make them out of wood as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, now they're steel, and then we put a little of that non-skid on there so it doesn't get too we, slippery. We put although, a lot of non-skid A lot of non-skid. <laughs> although, usually a couple months into deployment, it seems to wear off from the places that get worn the most. All right, so we've got two different facilities that manage some of the operations, and we're going to try to get through all the different operations. But first, we have what's called flight deck control. What can you tell us about who's in there and what their jobs are? So flight deck control is at the base of the island, forward. And the island is the big structure that sticks up on the right side of the ship, about a middle of it, and that's where 
So it's about a third of the way back. It actually okay. is pretty is it deceiving, back? Right. but it's about a third of the way back, and, and it is the structure that's on the starboard side of the ship. Uh, and on the forward part of that island, at the flight deck level, is what's called, you said, flight deck control. Flight deck control is home for the handler and his team. And the handler handler's job is to make sure that airplane movement is coordinated in order to accomplish the mission. Whether that is carrier qualifications, whether that is cyclic ops, he is in charge of moving airplanes around so that catapults can be used, the resting wires are clear, helos can land, and they do that by having a team of aircraft handlers, what we call yellow shirts, that um, have spent a lot of time studying um, the best layouts possible for airplanes, where to park them, where to do maintenance on them, and and keep this madness going for as long as flight operations are going. So let me see if I can try an analogy here. And Pappy, tell me if you think it's, it's a good one. So for the listener, next time you're at a major airport, if you watch through the window what's going on out there, there's aircraft moving, some under their own power, many of them being towed. At the airport, I think, and I work there, so I should know, I mean, most of that is coordinated at a local level. In other words, if I'm going to be pushed back from Gate 72 because I'm departing L.A. to get to San Francisco, well, I can talk to someone and they can clear me to do that, but they're just looking in that area. And meanwhile, there might be, you know, trucks and vehicles moving back and forth. But on the flight deck of a carrier, the handler, who is a person who's kind of graduated up to that position, he probably worked on the flight deck for a while, he is now coordinating all those moves. So if somebody's pushing back from over here, or they're parking a jet over there, the handler knows about it, and he is on the radio and talking, and the people are trained so they know when they're pushing an airplane or pulling an airplane or other aircraft are moving under their own power, that all of this is choreographed, and it all works. I mean, very rarely does it not work, and something happens, and they bang into each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's well choreographed. Absolutely. So like you said, everybody needs to know what they're doing, what the game plan is. Handler... In flight, the control has a couple of tables, and the tables have the layouts of the aircraft carrier and all of the airplanes that are on board the ship, and they're laid out exactly in the position that they are on the ship, and they know if airplane 304 is going to fit in the spot right next to the nav pole, and they know that the airplane right next to it needs fuel, has the wing spread. All that information flows in and out of flight deck control. It gets put out on the radios. One interesting piece is that only about 10% of the people on the flight deck actually have a radio. Most of the stuff gets done via hand signals. Still in 2018. Still, still on this day and age, <laughs> only about 10% Amazing. of the folks have radios. And they all know what their job is. They all know the areas. Every single area on the ship, on the flight deck, has a name. So, you know, they know, hey, 304 needs to go to the six-pack, spinning in front of the uh, wires, you know, pushing back into the finger. All that stuff means, you know, it's huge information for those folks, and uh, it make, makes it work. I think anyone who lives a specialized life can identify with, you get to know something so well, you can get your own jargon. So like you said, every part of the ship on the top on the flight deck has its own spot that as they call it and they can coordinate that mm-hmm. now you did say the word nav pole and just for everyone who's listening that's just a golly that thing's probably 30 feet tall but it's up about the first third so you said the island's mm-hmm. at about the back mm-hmm. third but this is up at the front third and it's it's just i'm not sure what the purpose is but. so it is it is just forward of elevator one and we put wind information okay and gps receivers up there just for interference it also provides the bridge with a accurate navigating cue. Because when we are on the bridge, since the bridge is not on the center of the ship, uh-huh. we can't look at the bow and figure out where we're going because it's offset. So the nav pole actually sits smack in the middle of the bridge so you can look outside from the bridge, look at the nav pole, and that's exactly where you're going. So it's a pole that helps with navigation. I yes. can't imagine how they came up with the name. Okay. Crazy. The, the bummer of it, unfortunately, is, I don't know if you've had to deal with this, Pappy, but I certainly did as the maintenance officer in a squadron, is it's a big pole on the side of the deck, and we tend to park jets at night with the tails hanging over the deck. And every so often... One jet gets pushed into the nap pole. Yeah, absolutely. And the pole usually wins. And sometimes we cut wires on stuff that we don't want to cut wires on on the nap pole with an airplane. So it, yeah. it goes both ways, right? But, yep. you know, no, we don't like things sticking, protruding out of the flight deck 
because of airplanes, but that is a necessary aid that we need for the driving itself of the ship. Gotcha. All right, so flight deck control is the handler and his crew of people who manage where things are going, whether, like you said, if they need fuel or armament or they're broken or fully functional. They've got the complete bubble on all that. But they aren't necessarily dealing with the takeoffs and landings and the airborne aircraft. Whose job is that and where is he hang out or she? So the, 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 the officer responsible for that is the air boss. And he lives all the way up in the O11, the top level of the island, just above the bridge. So that's a better seat than the captain has. So and he's one level up from the bridge that drives the whole ship and the captain. Absolutely. And so, so just, he's got big windows so he can see everything that's going on. And you said O11. So correct me if I'm wrong, like at right around what, the waterline or where we come on the ship is the O1? So the hangar bay is one. One. Okay. Above the hangar bay is... 01, 02, 03, 04, so on and so forth. Okay. Below the hangar bay is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so, so how far down can you go and how far up can you go? You can go down to the ninth deck and you can go up to the 011. And these are like, no kidding, floors in a house. So each one's a Absolutely. Oh, so it is All about right. a 20 <laughs> story structure. Right. Uh, not throughout the ship, right? Only on the island, but the flight deck is the 04. Right. So only on the island does it go up higher. Yeah. So you have sta- seven stories above the flight deck, and you have 13 stories down from the flight deck. Wow. And so the air boss is up on that O11, about as high as you can go. And what's he doing up there? So he is basically tower. If you have ever been to an airport, he is tower control. He is coordinating launches, recoveries, making sure that all of the airplanes take off and land safely uh, on board the carrier. So... Um, We are very procedural individuals in the Navy, right? There is a procedure for just about anything. And if everything works out and, you know, you can talk about zip lip and all that other stuff. Uh, Zip lip is when recovery happens uh, without anybody saying a word. And that, that is possible because we all know our role. We know all know our place and we know how to execute he won't say a word. He'll just monitor it and make sure that it all goes down smoothly. He talks to his yellow shirts every once in a while on inboard comms. But as far as him talking to airplanes, very, very different from an airport operation. Airport operations, they're always giving clearances. They're always talking to the airplanes. But if he does have to, he will. He'll come up on the radio and he'll say aircraft the beam, aircraft at the bow, um, and he'll give him specific direction. So whereas the handler in the flight deck control is probably directing almost everything, the air boss, if everything's going well, shouldn't have to direct anything, but he's kind of acting like a referee. You, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, I've heard, uh, and I've never seen this, but I guess he also is the safety monitor in some regards. Everybody's a safety officer up there. But if someone's where they shouldn't be, he has an announcing system. We call it the 5MC, where he can scream at somebody and get them away from something that's going to kill them. He gives them a little bit of guidance, <laughs> right? You don't have to yell at him. The thing is loud enough. But yes, he, he makes sure that nobody gets hurt by being in the wrong position, being in the wrong place during operations, whether it's turning an airplane around and blowing somebody over, could be into the ocean, could be into another airplane, could be into a piece of equipment, but also hurting an airplane or something else. So yeah, he'll come over in the 5MC and, and he'll be very directive. So he's the coach, the referee, and uh, everything up there. Now, he's not alone. He has a mini boss, which is another person like him, and they will share responsibilities. So he's ship's company, correct? Correct. Air boss and mini boss are ship's company, and he's got an arresting gear uh, operator. He's got a catapult representative. He's got a lens representative. He's got tons of folks up there that help them out, keep track of what's going on. The air boss, actually, if you are facing forward on the ship he handles the starboard side and aft and then the mini boss will handle the forward part of the ship so they'll kind of divide and conquer Uh, it usually happens at about the jbds that's where they they'll split up the jet blast deflectors correct yeah i'll I'll talk in acronyms here and then um, hopefully they, they can look it up or you can Well, give, we're going to get to the launches here in a bit, so we should direction, talk about but, those. But, yeah, they, they divide and conquer. One okay. has, you know, catapults three and four and aft, and the other one has the, the basic area behind the JBD and 
Catapults one and two. So the air boss will be a former squadron CO. The mini boss will be someone who maybe didn't screen for command but still has experience. So they're both 05 And they're both O five usually, yes. And they're not in squadrons anymore. They're part of ship's company. So theoretically, a person could leave an F-18 squadron in Lemoore, come down to the Carl Vinson in San Diego and be attached to the ship, even though he's an aviator. And are they flying with the, one of the squadrons at that time, or is there sole duty as the air boss in that case? No, they usually don't fly at that point. They, okay. Their job is busy enough as it is, making sure that airplanes go and recover safely. Right. So our air boss did not fly. So the air boss and mini boss, correct me if I'm wrong, they are the department heads for the air department part of the ship? Correct. And that's how many hundreds of people? About 600 folks okay. are in the air department. And so some of these are on the flight deck, some are in the hangar deck, some are in different spaces around the ship. But the people that are on the flight deck, he can look down at them, and he probably has communications as well, like the handler does, right? But in some cases, he can just look down and tell what people's jobs are by the clothes that they're wearing. Right? Absolutely. So let's talk about that. So I mentioned earlier the yellow shirts, right? Okay. Uh, and there are several colors. Let's talk about yellow first. Okay? okay, let's go with yellow. Yellow are airplane handlers. Those folks uh, started out as blue shirts, and we'll talk about blue shirts here, but okay. they, they, uh, they started out as blue shirts and graduated to being a, an aircraft director. Uh, I think, director, right? sorry, okay. that's yep. a handler, yes, uh, uh, aircraft director. Okay. And they are the, the folks uh, responsible for giving signals to the pilots in the cockpits and having them turn, stop, go, and uh, taxiing them around the flight deck. So when I land, let's say, at the end of a flight, and I'm sitting in the wires at full power, and I pull the power back, and I raise the hook, and I look to my right, there is a yellow shirt there waiting to get my attention, and he is going to direct my every move until I am parked in some spot that the handler has identified ahead of time and knows the name of, mm -hmm. and then he'll give the signal to chalk and chain me, and then once I'm secure, he'll walk away. And then conversely, a few hours later, if I'm going out and I'm ready to take off, he comes and takes control of me and gets me all the way to the catapult and launches me off. So it's not like I'm just in a parking lot in my vehicle driving around and looking for a parking spot. Someone's guiding me the entire time, and he wears a yellow jersey and helmet. Correct, and it's multiple people doing that. It's not one individual doing that from when you land, right? So there'll be a guy in charge of getting you out of the landing area. Right. And he'll pass you over to somebody that works in fly two, for example. In fly two, if you're going all the way to the bow, which is fly one's responsibility, he'll hand you over to another guy. So you might see five or six different airplane directors on your way to being chalked and chained and being handed over to your plane captain. So he's not just going to run along and hope that I follow him. He will guide me for a little while, and then he'll kind of touch his helmet and point to the other guy, almost like throwing a football or something. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy will have his hand up to get my attention. I see him, and then he starts directing me. And they've got this little dance of passing guys around. Aircraft directors don't really move. They stay in their general area, and they hand you off to different sections. And, and that, that allows those individuals to become experts at how to move you within that specified area of the flight deck. So you, you called it fly one, fly two. So the parts of the carrier are divided up into those subdivisions just so that maybe four or five guys who work, they know, hey, today we're working fly two, so they kind of know where they're at. Correct. It divides the flight deck into smaller divisions. Just like you said, you had the air, uh, air department. Well, you have V1, which is all the aircraft directors, and then within V1, you have Fly 1, Fly 2, Fly 3. So it's just smaller organizational structures, but it also represents a geographic area of the flight deck. Okay. And so you talked about they normally don't move, and in fact, at night, they're not supposed to move because if that's the only re reference you have and it's moving, you may move inadvertently to keep it in the same relative position. Absolutely. So it, during the day, they can walk a little bit. Right. Uh, but it's as dangerous because you could trip. As they're <laughs> directing you because they need to have contact with your airplane all the time. But at night, that is absolutely frowned upon. They're not supposed to do it. They're supposed to taxi you. And if they need to move, they will taxi you, stop you, show you the stop signal, then they'll move, and then they'll start moving you again. Okay. So yellow shirts are not people brand new to the carrier operations. They're a little bit more experienced. It usually takes those individuals about two, two and a half years from wow. when they show up on the ship to become an aircraft director. Okay. And they probably come from, you said, the blue shirts. So let's talk about them next. So the blue shirts are initially... What so what, so their rate? Let's go back to a little bit. So their rate is called ABHs, Aviation's Bosunsman's 
bosun's mate's handling. So that's an enlisted person's specialty. Correct. That is what we call their rate, ABH. So when they show up, brand new ABHs, whether they're airmen, airmen recruits, they show up to air department, they go to V1, and they get assigned to be a blue shirt. And in a, as a blue shirt, they hump chains, they pump chocks, and they watch flight operations as yellow shirts are moving airplanes, and they will escort basically the airplane with these chocks and chains and when the aircraft director tells them to stop they'll run they'll chalk the plane they'll put the chains down and they'll do some sort of manual labor jobs while they observe and start going through their what we call pqs um, personal qualification standards so they're they're building experience they're building experience they're building knowledge by watching by doing the job and so those are the blue shirts okay do blue shirts also operate the elevators also blue shirts uh, uh, operate the elevators but but those blue shirts won't be abhs they'll be abe's equipment okay but uh, as you can see, blue shirts come in different flavors, flavors, if you will. Yeah. All right. Let's keep moving through the colors. How about purple shirts? Purple shirts, those are the fuelies. And those are ABFs, Aviation Boston Mates Fuels. Um, we have them on the flight deck. We have them below decks. We have them all the way down in the ninth deck where all the fuel pumps are. And those are the guys responsible for getting the fuel from our tanks all the way to the flight deck and into your airplane. And in fact, they'll use the color purple for some of the piping throughout the ship. All of the piping. Okay. Any piping that carries JP5 will be colored purple for damage control efforts, being able to identify what's in that pipe. At a glance, you know, oh, purple pipe, it's got JP. Fuel in it. Yes, absolutely. Kerosene-based fuel. Okay. All right. So purple are grapes, as we call them. Uh, how about brown? Brown are usually for the maintenance personnel. Those belong to the squadron. So the plane captains. They'll be plane mm-hmm. captains. Absolutely. Those guys are the guys responsible for what we call turning around an airplane. From the time the airplane lands, basic, hey, check the tires, check the oil, check the fuel, and let's get it ready to go again. Uh, those are our plane captains uh, that work uh, in the squadrons. We just had an episode, episode 10, on aircraft maintenance, and the guest, Chucky, talked a little bit about some of those servicing requirements between flights. And so on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, when you, as the pilot, report out to your aircraft, the first person to meet you will be the brown shirt, as we call them. Mm -hmm. They'll give you a nice hearty salute and a handshake, and they help you strap in. They help you pre-flight. And when you come back, they're waiting for you. So they're really your best friend getting in and out of an aircraft. And those folks take a lot of pride in the condition of their airplane, and and it is their baby, and Right. They'll let you know it. And they, they will be relatively new in squadrons. Uh, I mean, so, not brand new, but... So the plane captain itself, himself or herself has been in the squadron probably a year. Okay. But when you get assigned to a squadron as the line shack and you start wearing a, a brown shirt, you also have a PQS that you have to right. go to. But the... Yeah, they... they Take pride in what their oh, airplane sure. looks like and how it works. And there have been plane captains, I guess the Air Force calls them crew chiefs, as long as there's been airplanes, as far as I know. I mean, I know they have World War II. So. All right, so that's brown. How about green? We touched on that a little bit with squadron maintenance. So squadron maintainers will wear green. All right, well, I hate to do this to you, but we are out of time for this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, so we have to leave it there for now. Not to worry, though. Pappy will be back. We will finish this discussion on the next episode. Not quite sure yet if that will be maybe just in a few days or 10 or 11 days like normal. So maybe if you have a strong opinion on that one way or the other, you might let me know and maybe I'll put it out just a little bit earlier. I do want to remind you, though, that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So stick with us and we will see you very soon to finish up this discussion on aircraft carriers. Until then, see ya.